go and sit with a private employer and you discuss what you're going to do, work, in this uh, software company or in this hamburger joint or whatever it is, you sit and you discuss, I'm going to come in on Monday through Friday at 8 o'clock and stay till 5, you know, the, the, this is, I'm going to work with this machine in this corner under these rules. And then you get to that key moment, how much are we going to get paid for this? And let's say, just for the simplicity, I'm going to get paid $20 an hour. At that moment, Marx says something which was a theoretical breakthrough, even though everybody knows this. But it's often true that the greatest breakthroughs are putting into words what we kind of all knew but quite didn't see. Here's his idea. If you're going to be paid by an employer $20 an hour, the following statement must be true. During that hour, your labor produces more for the employer that he sells at the end of the day than $20 worth. Because that's why he's in the bit. If paying you 20, you went to work and you did an output that gave another 20 for him to sell, then he's got nothing out of this. He's made 20 by selling what your labor helped to produce, but he's got to give it to you. And even though he likes you, he's not going to do that. There has to be in it, here we go, something for him. You have to produce, this is ineluctable, you have to produce more in every hour than you get paid. Otherwise, this system doesn't work. So for those of you, and I hate to tell you this because partly you need to hear it and partly I admit I get a kick out of telling you. <laughs> those of you who think that in a capitalist system you're never going to work for anybody who doesn't pay you what you're worth, you don't understand the system you're in. That is never going to happen because that's how this system works. So that when you go home at the end of a work day and you feel vaguely ripped off, it's because you are. <laughs> and the psychologist or others who helped you get over that feeling isn't doing you any favor. You need that feeling to fuel, well, it's very important, to fuel a recognition that that's what capitalist production is. You hire workers. Part of the time that they work, they produce an output that is given back to them at the end of the week. That's their wage. And part of it, that's your necessary labor. That's what Marx called it. The labor you do for your employer that's necessary for you because it, during that time, you're producing something for the employer. You all do know, right? You produce for the employer for eight hours. Then you go home and you leave in the workplace what you produce. Because if you take that home with you, what you produce, people in dark blue uniforms come to your house and they hurt you. Okay? <laughs> so you learn, no, no, don't do that. You got to leave there what you did. It's not yours. As fast as you produce it, it belongs to somebody else. So you work part of the time for yourself. You produce value that's paid back to you as your wage. But the only reason the employer hires you is that part of the time you do surplus labor. You do work, brains and muscle, that produces value that is beyond what you're paid. You produced it, and you don't get it. Again, <clears throat> you produced it, you don't get it. Who gets it? The employer gets it. He gets the surplus. Fast forward to General Motors. 100, 200,000 people producing surplus. Who gets it? The board of directors. How big is that? Uh, is that? That's 15 people. Fif that's the law in the United States and in all capitalism. 15 people draw into their hands the surplus of all the employees that are busy using their brains and muscles to make cars and trucks and all the other things General Motors makes. The board of directors, 12, 15 people, decide what to do with the surplus. And now, very quickly, part of it goes to the government in taxes, profits tax on corporations. They have to take, a, they have to, you know why? Because if they don't, the government comes, shuts them down. But that's not much of a discussion. But they do spend a lot of time trying to get that reduced, don't they? And now you know why. Because the less of the surplus they have to pay in taxes, the more of the surplus is available for what? Let's see. One of the other things you have to do with the surplus 
is pay managers. Managers don't make cars and trucks. They wouldn't have the faintest idea of how even to start. Their job is to do completely other things that don't produce anything. For example, the purchasing manager, what does he or she do? They go and buy the raw rubber and the raw steel and the raw other things that go into the car. They don't make anything. They're out there buying stuff. The sales manager, does he make anything? No. His job is to take the finished product, the car, and get rid of it, sell it to somebody. So you got to have all these people doing this if the enterprise is going to work, but they don't produce any value for you. So how do you pay them? You got to take a part of the surplus produced by those workers who produce for you something that you sell, and you give it to the managers. And now here comes a real simple idea. If you can save on taxes, that's less of the surplus you got to piss away as a capitalist on the taxes to the government, the more you can pay your top managers. Now there's an incentive. You tell your CEO, you get the taxes reduced, you get a bonus. The surplus that I would otherwise have to give the government, I give you. Where else is the surplus? It goes to the clerks, all those white collar workers who keep record. You know, did you come in on time? The person who keeps a record of whether the workers come in on time, they don't produce cars or trucks. They do no productive work at all. They do work that the company has to have. Got to keep records of who showed up and who didn't. But they don't help produce anything. So they get paid by another piece of the surplus. Last, not last, next to last. Shareholders, part of the surplus that is earned by a company from all of its productive workers who make stuff, Part of that is used and distributed to the shareholders, the owners of the company. I don't know how many of you understand corporate law, but this is how it works. The 15 people on the board of directors decide how much of the surplus is going to be paid out as dividends to the shareholders. The dividend paid by the so 12 people. 100,000 produce that, and 12 people who are themselves not producers, or 15 on the board, they decide. By the way, under the law, the board of directors has the right to distribute nothing of the surplus to the shareholders. There are many big companies in America that regularly distribute nothing to the shareholders. No dividend. Okay? Zilch. Or they can deliver all of it. It's entirely them who decide, that's the law. And finally, they can take a part of the surplus and use it to what Marx called accumulate capital, grow the company. Now please understand, what I have just told you is Marx's argument saying everything is about the employer, the board of directors and the major shareholders. You know most shares in American companies are owned by a tiny number of people. 1% of shareholders own 75% of the shares. So it's a tiny number of people. For most big corporations, a dozen or two major shareholders and 12 to 15 people on the board of directors selected by the shareholders. If you get on the board of directors, if the shareholders vote, every year they vote. You get one vote per each share you own. If you own a million <coughs> shares, you get a million votes. If you own no shares, you get no votes. Most workers at General Motors own nothing or they own 12 shares that their grandmother gave them on their confirmation. They have therefore no power. But those who own big blocks of shares, they have all the power. So a tiny number of people make all of the decisions. And are we surprised? They took the surplus and they said, you know, there's another distribution of the surplus. We're rich and powerful. We better give a cut of the surplus to the political system. That's what we're going to do. We're going to give to the candidate and the party and the special political action committee and all the other apparatus. Why? Why? You need this explained to you? To make sure that the 
inconvenience of a democratic voting system where everybody has one vote, not about how much money they have, but by the fact that they're a living person, that's a very dangerous arrangement. Tiny number of people make all the economic decisions. Mass of people have political power. You've got to neutralize that or else you're going to be giving a constant invitation to the mass of people to use the power of universal suffrage to undo the effects of the economy. So what they've done is they've bought the political system. But please understand, what employs people? If they use a lot of the surplus to accumulate, to grow their businesses, that means using the surplus to hire more people. We have employment, we have a good employment situation, we have jobs for all of us, if and only if the tiny number of people who gather the surplus into their hands decide for their own reasons to take a large portion of it to grow the company. These days, corporations are making enormous surpluses because wages are low <coughs> and productivity is high. But you know what? They're not accumulating capital with it at all. The little bit of growing the company that they do happens in another country. They move the money out of the United States and they grow the business in China or Brazil or someplace else. So in this country, nothing. Our politics is bought by the surplus. Our growth is stymied by how they use the surplus. The wealth of the shareholders goes crazy because they distribute a lot of it to them. All the social problems, all the economic problems we've talked about tonight have one common core a system in which the mass of people gather in the enterprises we have, the corporations, to produce a surplus for a tiny group of people who use them in a way we all have to live with, but we have no power to in influence or shape. We're excluded. So of course the logic, if that's your analysis, and this is Marx's analysis, this is what he does in Capital. If that's the analysis, the, the conclusion, in a sense, leaps out at you. The mass of people, the ones working there, to start with them, they've got to make the decision of what is done with the surplus they all produce. This is not a revolutionary demand, although it is in our culture. It's a logical outcome of the analysis, which is why Marxian economics can't be taught, of course. Because once you lay it out here, and I can tell from your faces, it's kind of straightforward. You can kind of see what ought to be done here. It's done, not rocket science. So you can't have this explained to the American people. Because especially in a country where you babble endlessly about democracy, oh, everything is justified by democracy, that the first question a half-wit would ask is, um, um, uh, excuse me, but um, w uh, democracy would mean that the people as a whole would make these decisions. The mass of people who produce the surplus and the mass of people who live with the result of the surplus. That's the us would have to have a way to decide what to do with the surplus we produce since it shapes the lives we live. And that's the end of capitalism. No more small group of people, no more accumulation of shares, no more boards of directors elected by shareholders according to how many shares.